We are changing. You are changing. There are more and more of us every day. You're getting married less, you're divorcing more, you're living longer, and you're living more and more alone. At the same time as we know, climate is changing. The purpose of my talk today is to uh, consider how can our housing stock respond to these dual pressures, social and environmental. <clears throat> and how will architects respond? To start with, we need to adapt our housing stock to actual demographics which are changing. And we need to make our cities viable or keep them viable to attract young people and to take care of the increasing elderly. This is also to resist the increasing urban sprawl, which we know to be one of the main contributors to carbon emissions and to climate change. And this is the underpinning of the first project I'll be talking about on my left here, which is our, our competition winning scheme that Anna just mentioned for the first micro unit apartment building in New York City. The second project is a, a project we designed for the Museum of Modern Arts exhibition Rising Currents, which looks more directly at connecting issues of population change and environmental pressures in the face of uh, rising sea levels and uh, storm surges. So my micro New York is going to be Manhattan's first micro unit uh, building to be uh, built next year. Um, it responds really to these statistics. 60% of New York households are comprised of one to two people. 45% of us live alone. And this is a, glo a growing global trend in the developing world. 42% um, of people in Tokyo live alone. And in Europe, it's 50%. Uh, Amsterdam, Berlin, Paris. In developing nations, this trend will increase along with increasing standards of living, advances in medicine, emancipation of women, and so on. So we're going to see this uh, effect throughout the world. Um, the problem in New York City is quite simple, is we don't have enough uh, small apartments. Um, basically, the Michael, Mayor B Michael Bloomberg's administration saw in this an opportunity to revise uh, housing regulations which are still um, based on post-war housing policies which consider that uh, you know, every family is a nuclear family, uh, two, two parents, two kids. I confess to being one of those with my partner Mimi Huang. But really, we're only 18%. So, um, we won the competition in January. Um, it's called My Micro New York. And our project is, uh, looks like a microcosm of the New York skyline. It consists of 55 uh, small apartments, about 30 square meters each. And um, we really saw our challenges as twofold. One, how do we make the most humane small apartment possible? Uh, at 30 square meters, that's a real challenge. And the second one is, how do we uh, provide a new identity for what's going to be a prototype for New York? And the first inclination we had is that it's not about the individual. It's not about expressing boxes of units. Um, it's really about a, a variety of scales that uh, people living in small apartments will have to engage in. So when you live in a small apartment, you, you live beyond your four walls. So you have to give something back as an architect. You live on your floor. You live in your building. You live in your block. You live in nested scales of communities. And for this reason, we need a variety of public amenities throughout the building of a diverse nature. We need to provide lots of light and connection to the street. We need to provide choices. So each unit is comprised of what we call a toolbox, which has what you need, and a canvas, which allows you for uh, creative expression. You also need height, so three meter ceiling heights with a lot of overhead storage and uh, very tall uh, sliding glass doors, which turn your whole apartment into a balcony. When your apartment's that small, it can really be a balcony. <laughs> um, and then. This will be built actually in Brooklyn as a modular steel, welded steel frames in a, a factory by Capsis, just about a, a one kilometer away from our office, and erected by our partners, the developers Monadnik Development, in, starting hopefully next January. It's a very quick process. The uh, design process is uh, cut in half, um, but the fun part will just be a three-week installation of, uh, of units. So we can, we can lower our carbon emissions by building intelligently. Um, we can address uh, climate change broadly as architects by, by making cities viable, but ultimately we still have to address the effects of climate change. And the, the dominant ones for us in New York, being a coastal city, of course, sea level rise and uh, storm surges. But unfortunately, we always learn the hard way that environmental catastrophes address or affect a wide array of systems, eventually turning physical damage into social damage. And um, so therefore, the problems have to be stated in a complex enough way to deal with the complexity of, of the problem. So MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, in sort of clairvoyantly two years ago, uh, held an, uh, an, an exhibition called Rising Currents. This is a map of uh, the, the flooding of um, Hurricane Sandy. It came within one block of our office and architects. And yet, even though we weren't flooded, we were affected in many, many ways. So I think the effects of uh, you know, disasters like this integrate a wide variety of financial, cultural, and social networks. But the Rising Currents show um, 
asked five of us, five offices, including ours, to imagine a future New York Harbor that would be resilient to sea level rise and storm surges. And so we uh, imagined actually that the harbor would be the center of a new regional metropolis that would like to get wet. Um, and when we were assigned to look at the southern, the mouth of the harbor, you see Manhattan on the top, this is the first line of defense. This is where politicians want to put a big storm surge barrier. We told ourselves it's not a design problem. Architects are not uh, big enough for that, really. It's a, for us a window onto a possible future, a possible future in New York, which we imagined as a kind of a zoning uh, manifesto. So the paradox is this. As um, sea level rise and storm surges affect our city and inundate up to six meters for a category three hurricane, uh, the paradox is that we are getting flooded with people, really. Um, by 2030, we'll have one million new inhabitants, which is nothing compared to Bangalore, as we heard this morning, or Mumbai. But it does mean, if you use a funny arithmetic, that for every centimeter of sea level rise, we have 80,000 new people. So uh, what can we do? Um, we can't really run for the hills. We have to build. Um, at the same time, we have to let our cities get wet and adapt them to, to, to that. And as we know, eight out of 10 of the world's largest cities are coastal cities. Mexico City and Sao Paulo are exceptions. Doesn't mean you're safe, actually. Um, as we know, you'll still be affected, and you might not want to admit it, but if Rio gets uh, you know, hit, something will happen to you as well. So instead of uh, building a massive storm surge barrier, which, as I said, would be politically expedient and fit right within a mayoral uh, term, we propose an idea of dispersed infrastructure, redundant, resilient, and ecologically sustainable. And this is partly inspired by Jaime Lerner, Brazilian urbanist and three-time mayor Curitiba, whom we visited in 2006 to discuss these issues. Um, and his uh, idea of urban inf inf uh, acupuncture is really that with a minimum number of points, we can affect a larger array of conditions. So this is a map that we exhibited in the museum. Uh, what you see in orange is what we imagine to be top-down uh, government-implemented uh, interventions, and the rest would be taken care of by other urban actors, private initiative, NGOs, and in fact, ecology itself. I'll talk about three of these initiatives. The first one is to design and build a series of artificial islands, not a dam, throughout as a kind of gauzy new perimeter for the harbor interconnected with inflatable dams, such as those you see in the Netherlands and in Japan, vinyl reinforced or nylon reinforced rubber dams. And these would basically uh, be floated out as concrete hollow sections, sunk at 12 meters of depth maximum, filled with water, and eventually would accrete sediment from the Hudson, becoming new habitats and new ecosystems. With sensors, these would inflate just a little bit like an airbag in your car, and then be filled with water, and within one hour could protect New York. But we know that these will fail. So the second line of defense would be a series of uh, what we call wave attenuating piers that absorb the kinetic impact of the waves. And these would extend from uh, corridors, uh, urban corridors, which we could reinforce for mobility and to improve uh, social and, and employment conditions, and ultimately connect a new breed of ferries, biogas ferries, which could be powered by bio biodiesel. The sewage plant in Brooklyn produces enough sewage to drive one ferry around the world every day and a new harbor loop. And we all know that mobility is a crucial issue during disasters. But in addition, these will become an armature for public leisure, new forms of housing, uh, floating mobile programs, buildings that could accommodate evacuation during an emergency. But these will fail too. So we have to, and I'm getting to the crux of my point, we have to uh, redesign our housing um, so that it's resilient. And this is a little bit of a provocation, not really meant as a real project, I guess, but we imagined upside down housing. Housing that could be hung, by private initiative or by the government from shared infrastructure rather than streets. The only thing that would float would be the streets themselves and treatment wetlands which would take the all housing off the sewage grid, off the electrical grid. We would implement flat roofs to make sure that you could uh, escape like in Saigon uh, for evacuation. So in conclusion, we need to adapt. We need to adapt our cities to changing demographics, to changing uh, climate. And we need to keep our cities viable for real humans, not statistical humans from outmoded statistics. But uh, I'm sure this is a pretty depressing talk. I've been talked about hurricanes, no marriage, very small apartments. Um, I'd like to end on one bright note, which is that I think that we're well positioned to do this, we together, because of what I call an incredible confluence of design intelligence. Right now, we are capable to work together across disciplines to address problems of sufficient complexity. I think that we as our problems become more and more complex, so does our thinking have to be. But with simple solutions, we must adapt. Thank you very much.